chapter 2 this morning as we continue in our series on basic Bible truth. And uh, this morning we're going to talk about the two natures uh, of the believer. The Word of God, in a number of passages, it's very clear, at least to me, some disagree with this teaching, but I, I see it in the Word of God. A believer has two natures. And new believers need to learn about this doctrine as soon as possible. Or they'll become confused, discouraged, and defeated. Upon salvation, we enjoy the newness of life that is in Christ. And with a heart full of gratitude for salvation and the price that Christ paid for that salvation, we should desire to live as pure and as right as possible. We want to please the Lord, our Savior. But it doesn't take very long to realize the fleshly desires are not gone. Uh, that we're still tempted to commit the same sins we committed before we were saved. And sometimes people wonder, if I'm really saved, why did I do that? Or why did I want to do that? And without an understanding of what the Bible teaches about the two natures, the new believer will eventually, I think, I've been there, you begin to lose the joy of your salvation. You don't lose salvation. Of course, you cannot lose your salvation, but you can lose the joy of it. And thinking, I can't live the Christian life, which is actually true, and you need to understand that, but you need to know the answer to that, that we can do it through Christ. And doubt becomes to set in, uh, begins to set in. People wonder, am I even saved, you know? And, and I'm not going to ask for hands, but you, I'm sure you can relate to what I'm talking about here. I remember that in my, in my early Christian walk. And so it's very important to learn this. It's vital. And so I want to include this in this series on basic truth for new believers. So what we're going to talk about is three things, Lord willing. I, this takes a series usually for me. I'm going to try to do it in one message, so I won't be able to cover it all. I just want to get the basics here. The explanation, what do we mean by two natures? How is that even possible? And then the conflict of these two natures, but the victory that we can enjoy knowing the truth about um, what the Word of God says concerning the Christian walk. So the explanation, the conflict, and the victory, that's what we plan to look at this morning. Now, as to the explanation, uh, one of the definitions for the word nature in Noah Webster's 1828 dictionary is the essence, essential qualities or attributes of a thing, what constitute it, what it is. All right, so whenever we first hear the statement, the believer has two natures, doesn't that sound strange? How's that possible? What do you mean we have two natures? How can one person have two natures? Well, the Bible, and we're going to see it here in Ephesians 2, it speaks of the corrupt nature of a man. But the Bible also refers to the divine nature in 2 Peter 1, 4, and how believers can be partakers of the divine nature. So the flesh, when you're reading in the Bible, uh, in Paul's epistles, and you come across the flesh, the flesh, you, you know, that, that is not just talking about. Your, your physical body, obviously, that, that's part of it, but it's more than that. It's the human nature or what we are by physical birth. And all born of the flesh, raise your hand if you were born of the flesh. <laughs> what we are by nature is children of wrath and disobedience. Okay, Ephesians chapter 2, verse number 1. And you, now he's writing to believers... And he's reminding them what they were for they were saved. And you hath he quickened. Quickened means to be made alive. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. They were alive physically, but they were dead spiritually because death is a separation. There's different kinds of death in the Bible, but it's always a separation. So they were dead in that they were separated from God, dead in sin, spiritually speaking. Wherein... In time past, you walked according to the course of this world. Now, who sets the course of this world? Read on. According to the prince of the power of the air. And that's Satan. 
And he's called the God of this world and the prince of this world. Spiritual wickedness in high places. He's the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now worketh, now here's a scary thing, in the children of disobedience. The Lord Jesus looked at some religious people in John chapter 8 who were trusting in their religion instead of the Lord. He said, you're of your father, the devil. All right, so you're not born into this world a child of God. The politicians like to talk about, we're all God's children. No, we're not. Paul said, you're the children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You don't become a child of God until you put your faith in Christ. The lost are children of the devil. Okay? You become a child of God when you trust Christ as your Savior. So he said, work, they work, worketh in the children of disobedience. Disobedience is our character in the flesh. Among whom also we all had our conversation. Conversation means your whole manner of life. Now notice Paul. Who was Paul before he was saved? He was super religious. Very religious. You couldn't get more strict in religion than Saul of Tarsus. And yet he puts himself right in there with pagan Gentiles. He said, we all had our conversation this way. Hey, religious flesh is still flesh. Irreligious flesh is flesh. Okay, you can't improve the flesh. He said, we all had our conversation times past and the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires, and that defines the word lust as it's a desire. Desires of the flesh and of the mind and were by nature. I had a guy one time, he said he's a Bible believer, right? Division, all that. Try to tell me we don't have a sin nature. So what do you do with a verse like this? We're by nature the children of wrath. That's our nature. Of course we have a sin nature in the flesh. By nature the children of wrath, even as others. Okay, so... Uh, we, this is what we are in the flesh. Now you'll notice, by the way, in the, in the verses we just read that Paul mentions the world, the flesh, and the devil. And those are great enemies. But over in chapter 5 of Ephesians, he said in verse 6, Ephesians 5, 6, Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things. Now what was he talking about? Well, if you look in verse 3, fornication, uncleanness. Verse 4, filthiness. Verse 5, whoremonger, idolater. These things, sins. Let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. Okay? And what he was describing there in those previous verses was Lost sinners in their sins, living in those sins, and if they don't get saved, they'll face the wrath of God. The children of disobedience are children of wrath. Okay, so how did this happen? Well, the first man, Adam, was created in the image of God, and he enjoyed fellowship with God, but Adam chose to sin against God and disobeyed the Word of God. And the Lord said, in the day that you eat of this tree that I'm telling you not to eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, thou shalt surely die. Well, he was dead in trespasses and sins the day he sinned against God. And he eventually also died physically. God could have killed him right then and there physically, but in his mercy provided a covering, that blood sacrifice of that lamb. And uh, he was teaching right away that sins must be dealt with by a blood sacrifice. But he, he, he died, and he, he was dead in trespasses and sins, separated from the Spirit of God. What was Adam doing after he fell? When God came in the garden, Adam was trying to hide from God. He separated from God. All that are born into this world are born in the image of Adam. Okay, In Genesis 5, 3, it talks about his son being born in his own image. Adam was created in the image of God, but he fell and marred that image and his son was born in his image. The law of nature, the way God set it up, is kind begets kind. It always works that way. So you know what Jesus Christ said? That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That's all the flesh can produce is flesh. <laughs> corrupt flesh produces corrupt flesh. 
But he said, that which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. That's what the Spirit produces. And that's two natures. And he said that in John chapter 3, verse 6. That's a great principle. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the Spirit is Spirit. Now, there is a distinction between sin, which is the root problem, and sins, which are the fruit of the problem. The reason why we commit sins is because of sin in our nature. The Apostle Paul, and you want to look at this in Romans 7, he referred to sin, singular, as a nature throughout the passage. I'll give you one verse for an example. In Romans 7, verse 17, Now then it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Sin dwells in our flesh. Okay, so no matter how religious a person may be, the flesh cannot be changed. The flesh cannot be improved. And that's why Jesus told Nicodemus, who was a very religious man, he said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh. That which is born of the spirit is spirit. Marvel not that I said unto thee, ye must be born again. Nicodemus wasn't going to inherit the kingdom of God because of his corrupt flesh. He needed a new birth of the spirit. The flesh, and you couldn't get more religious than old Nicodemus. He was very religious, but the flesh is flesh. Okay? Now, a lot of people think, well, I'll, I'll do better. I'll make resolutions. I'll turn over a new leaf. I'll try harder. You can try and try and try, but the Bible says a leopard can't change his spots. An Ethiopian can't change his skin. It says in the book of Jeremiah, it said you can't do good when you're accustomed to evil. That's your nature. And so what is possible, you can't change that flesh from being corrupt, but what you can do is make a fair show in it. <laughs> that's what a lot of people... That's what religion is. It's just a fair show in the flesh. You remember what Paul said in Galatians 6 and verse number 12. Um, he said, as many, I'll give me a moment to turn there. I'm sorry. And while you're finding it, I'll get my coffee. Because this old flesh still needs coffee, you know. <laughs> yeah, I don't got my glorified body yet, so I get run down sometimes. <laughs> Galatians 6, 12. I know it's hard for y'all to believe that I don't have a glorified body yet, but I don't. <laughs> That's a joke, a big joke. Okay, just seeing if you're listening. Galatians 6, 12. As many as desire to make a fair show in the flesh, they constrain you to be circumcised only lest they should be su su suffer persecution for the cross of Christ. In other words, they think they're going to be made righteous by the circumcision of the flesh. So, but it, you know, what they do, what religion says is your flesh performs. There's things you can do in your flesh. And today a big thing would be baptism. You know, water baptism makes you right with God. No, it makes you wet. It doesn't make you right with God. And they say, well, whatever you can do in your flesh, that's a show. There's nothing you can do in your flesh. It might impress men, but it's not impressing God. I can tell you that. And the Bible's clear on this. So... Look what the scripture says about the flesh. Run down these real quick. And this is not all, but this, this is five, the number of death. It'll give you a, a taste of what the word of God has to say, say about our flesh. The word of God says, within every one of us is a light that needs to be fanned into a flame. And there's great potential in you to, no, nah, baloney. It doesn't say any of that. It says the flesh profits nothing. That's what Jesus in the red letters said, my friend. All oh, these people talking about they love Jesus and the red letters. I don't think they believe the red letters. You ever read some of the stuff he said? The flesh profiteth nothing. John 6, 63. Paul said in his flesh dwells no good thing. Now in Philemon, by the way, it's interesting. Paul talked about in Philemon every good thing in him, but then he said which is in Christ. The good things in us are because of Christ. In our flesh dwells no good thing. In Romans 8, he taught that the flesh is enmity against God and it cannot please God. He said, they there in the flesh cannot please God. It's enmity. It's in a state of constant opposition. It's enmity against God. 
It's not subject to God. It can't be. He said it can't please God. In 1 Corinthians 2.14, it teaches that our flesh cannot know the things of the Spirit of God. Your flesh cannot learn the spiritual truth of God's Word. It has to be learned by the Spirit of God. And uh, it is corrupt. Ephesians 4.22, it is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. It's corrupt. And, he, and he's writing to believers, when you get saved, your flesh doesn't. Your flesh and my flesh is just as corrupt as before we got saved. Very important to understand this. So salvation then is not reformation of the flesh. It's regeneration by the Spirit. Okay, Titus chapter 3. Look over in Titus chapter number 3. Titus 3 beginning in verse number 3. Titus 3.3. 3. For we ourselves also were sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving divers' lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. So who's that about? You <laughs> and me? That's human nature right there, my friend. And he said, and, and he said well, that's not me. Well, you're, you're right in there under that word deceived, if you think that's not you. Verse 4, but. Thank God. But after that the kindness and love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done. Our flesh can't be righteous. We can't earn salvation by the works of the flesh. It's not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to His mercy, He saved us. He's the Savior, we're the sinner. He saved us. How? By the washing of regeneration. And Church of Christ will come in and say, that's got to be baptized. That's what it's talking about. The washing is baptism. No, it's not. It's not baptism because he just said not by works of righteousness. Is water baptism a work you can do? Yes or no? Yes, it is. Therefore, it's not in this verse. You can't possibly be saved by water baptism. The rest of the verse tells you what he's referring to and renewing of the Holy Ghost. It's a spiritual washing that we are cleansed of all our sins because of the blood of Christ and the Spirit of God being in us. We're made new in Him. It's a spiritual thing there in verse 5, not a water issue. Um they go into John 3 where Jesus told Nicodemus, you've got to be born of water and of the Spirit. Well, the water is the physical birth and the Spirit is the new birth. <laughs> okay, and you can go in that passage and see that. The water is not water baptism in John chapter 3. Folks, water baptism can't save anybody in any dispensation. I know it was required as an expression of repentance and faith under the gospel of the kingdom, but do you really think water can wash away someone's sins? No. <laughs> No, that's not possible. So he says here, he says, verse number, uh, continuing reading on, verse 6, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Savior, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according uh, to the hope of eternal life. And by the way, that word hope in the Bible is not a doubtful thing at all. It's a certainty. It just hadn't happened yet, but we're going to be glorified and reign with Christ. But it's all by His mercy. It's all by His grace. It's all by His love. It's what He has done for us. And so to be born of the flesh is generation. But to be born of the Spirit is regeneration. Okay, it's very simple. I was born of the flesh. When I got saved, I was born of the Spirit. Regeneration. That's what that means. And people want to come up with some complicated elaborate scheme to get around that but you can't get around it okay regeneration you are born of the flesh of this world you got to be born of the spirit i realize in john chapter 3 the lord in the context it's got to do with the gospel the kingdom and his dealings with israel and so forth i understand that but there's a principle there that's still true today you can't see the kingdom of god unless you're born of the spirit that's still true Paul said we're going to inherit the kingdom of God, didn't he? The kingdom of God is bigger than just the kingdom on the earth with Israel. It's bigger than that. It's more vast than that. 
and flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God, Paul said. And so it's true that we also must be born of the Spirit. And that's why Paul said regeneration. And that's why in the book of Galatians, he talked about those born after the Spirit. Now, some people say, oh, we're, because God said born again of Israel, they think, well, he can't say that can't apply to us today. And to the people who say that, I always ask them, how did you become a child of God? How do you become a child of God without being born? <laughs> One guy said, well, I was adopted into the family. You, know, you don't understand the Bible word adoption if you're going to try to make that an argument. People come up with this stuff because, folks, let me just warn you. I've, I've warned you before, I'll warn you again. There, the Bible must be rightly divided. We understand that. But that doesn't mean there are no principles and connections and harmony to the Scripture. The same blood by which Israel will be saved is the blood by which we're saved. And yet you got people saying, I'm not saved by the blood of the New Testament. Christ didn't shed two different kinds of blood on the cross. He only shed the blood of the New Testament, and I'm saved by the blood of the New Testament. And the reason why people have a problem with that is because they don't understand the difference between a covenant and a testament. And there is a difference. I, look, folks, we're saved by the blood of the New Testament even though we're not under the new covenant that God's going to make with Israel at the second coming. You got to study these things, and so being born of the Spirit, uh, it's like people. I just recently taught about how it, today, when we trust Christ and get saved, we repent because we have changed our heart and mind. In that we know we're a sinner and we want to be saved, and we're not going to trust in ourselves. We're going to trust in Christ. That's repentance. That's what that is. And people will get mad and say, "We don't repent. We don't." And I can give you Romans two, Acts seventeen, Acts twenty. Acts 26, I can give you all these passages, and you can make all the arguments you want, but I don't want to hear it until you explain to me how Paul didn't mean what he said in those passages. When I have Scripture, I could care less about your private interpretation of Scripture. So scripture is clear also on this issue. So that was a little sidetrack. Got to run a rabbit every once in a while. <laughs> All right, so they are the, the regenerated believer then. Okay, remember we said Adam... Uh, he fell, and his son was born in his image. Well, Paul said in Colossians 3 that when we get saved, we are renewed in the knowledge after the image of him that created him. And so now we become a child of God, and we are in his image, and we have his spirit in us. Um, notice in Ephesians 2, Ephesians 2, where we started, Ephesians 2. He talked about what we were before we were saved, and look at this wonderful Truth here in verse 4, but God. He makes all the difference. We couldn't save ourselves. No way, no how. But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we are dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved, and hath raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us through Christ Jesus. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works. Titus, he said, not by works. Here, it's not of works, lest any man should boast, for we are. So he talked about what we were, but what God did, and now who we are as a result. His workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them." We have been created in Christ Jesus unto good works. In other words, it's about his working in us and who he's made us to be. It's not the flesh. It's Christ in us, Christ through us. Because when we get saved, Paul said, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all, the old things are passed away. All things become new. That's 2 Corinthians 5, 17. We become a new creature in Christ. We're in him, and he's in us. That's the church he's building today. Look over in uh, Colossians chapter 2. Colossians chapter 2. So what happens is we are taken out of the old man. See, the flesh is called the old man. The spirit is the new man, who we are in Christ. So what happens is we're taken out of the old man, the flesh, and we are put in the new man, the body of Christ. How does that happen? Colossians 2, verse 10. And um, he said, have put on, 
and have put on the new man. Well, back up to verse 9. I should start in verse 9. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. This new man is described as this, where there's neither Greek nor Jew, circumcision nor uncircumcision, barbarian, Scythian, bond or free, but Christ is all and in all. All right, so we are in the new, the new man, which is the body of Christ, the church God is building today. And notice over in Colossians, I'm sorry, I meant to go back to chapter 2. Colossians 2. That's my problem. I was looking in the wrong. I wanted to read that too, by the way. But when I said Colossians 3.10, I meant Colossians 2.10. Let's read that. I'm just going to read them backwards, but we read both of them, okay? Uh, Colossians 2.10. And, uh, well, I want to back up to verse 9 there too. For in him, talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Okay, and ye are complete in him. You can't add anything then. The moment you're saved, you're complete. Christ is everything. He's the fullness of the Godhead, meaning he is God. The Godhead is the Father, the Son, and the Spirit. He's the fullness of that bodily. And we're complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power, in whom also you are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands. A spiritual operation that does this in putting off the body of the sins of the flesh by the circumcision of christ that's how we got out of the old man it's a spiritual thing buried with him in baptism that's just a spiritual spiritual baptism the spirit puts us in christ wherein also you are risen with him through the faith of the operation of god it's not talking about water baptism this is the operation of god who hath raised him from the dead all right, so I'm taking out of the old man the flesh. I'm putting the new man the body of Christ. I'm taking out of the old man by a spiritual circumcision. I'm put into the new man by a spiritual baptism. Now, the nature of the flesh is sin, but the nature of the spirit is righteousness. Look at Ephesians chapter 4. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24. Ephesians 4, 24. And that you put on the new man, which after God is created, so we're a new creature in Christ, in righteousness and true holiness. The new man is righteousness and true holiness. What is the flesh? Sin. All right, so you got both. When you were born in this world of the flesh with a corrupt human nature, when you got saved, you were born of the Spirit with a, a new divine nature that is righteousness. So you've got the sin nature and the righteous nature of God, and both exist within the believer while we walk on this earth waiting for the Lord to come. And you know what? The flesh, we cannot change it. We cannot improve it. We cannot make it good in the sight of God. And nowhere in the Bible is it taught that we can eradicate it. Like, you know, in this life, that we can get rid of the old sin nature. It's going to be with us um, till we die or till the Lord comes, which I hope that's the case, that we, he comes before we die. But nonetheless, that flesh is with us. Now, that's not an excuse to live in it, walk in it. No, no, we're going to get to that, but it's there. All right, look at the origin. The, the old nature and the new nature are opposite in origin. All right, we already talked about the flesh and the spirit. What a contrast of origin. That was more the flesh is flesh. That was more the spirit is spirit. Character. In Galatians 5, Paul talked about the works of the flesh which are manifest, which are these. And he named all these awful sins, you know, adultery and fornication and murder and on and on and on. That's the works of the flesh. But then he talked about the fruit of the spirit. Love, joy, peace, and so on. What a contrast between the character of the old man and the character of the new man. To sum it up, the old man is sin. The, the, the new man is righteousness. And then about the, the destiny, uh, they, they, are, they are opposite in destiny in that one, the flesh, is, it's death, and, and the spirit is life. Okay. Now, number two, the conflict. Galatians 5, verse 16 and 17. So, the existence of two natures within the same person that are of contrary origin, character, and destiny, that creates a conflict, okay? And the Bible's clear on this. Galatians 5, 16, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. That word lusteth there, talking about desire. 
The flesh desires to control you. The spirit desires to control you. And these are contrary, the one to the other, the flesh versus the spirit, so that you cannot do the things that you would. Now, we'll talk more about that in a little bit, but what that's talking about in the context, if you put yourself under the law, you can't walk in victory under that. That's, that's giving place to the flesh to do that. But th th they're contrary the one to the other, okay? So the flesh desires to sin, the spirit desi desires for us to be righteous, and that's a conflict every true believer experiences. Every true believer experiences conflict, but sadly a lot of them don't understand it. And a lot of people think they're not saved. It's a reason for doubt for many, but it ought to be a reason for assurance. What do I mean? That's one of the blessings of the conflict is the assurance of salvation it provides because when you've been regenerated by the Spirit, now you have this conflict. I didn't have this conflict before I was saved. You understand? If you face this conflict of struggling, of wanting to do right but failing to do it, and you have this, that, that's just evidence that the Spirit of God's in you. I didn't, I didn't have a conflict within me before I was saved. I just did what I wanted to do. The conscience bothered me some a little bit, but it's a lot different when you've got the Spirit of God in you. Okay, and so another blessing of the conflict is that it teaches us by experience that our flesh is totally corrupt and we, can, we, we must totally depend on God for the victory. As in Romans 7, 24, and in Romans 7, Paul is talking about this conflict and how the flesh cannot perform under the law. And what that leads you to is this, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? When you realize you can't live the Christian life and your flesh can't do it, then you ought to cry out to God and realize you must depend on Him just like you depended on Him to get saved. You must depend on Him to live the Christian life. As in Philippians 3.3, 3, we are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The circumcision there is not talking about physical. It's talking about spiritual as what we saw in Colossians 2. The true people of God in this age of grace worship God in the Spirit. All our confidence is in Christ, not in the flesh. Okay? So we cannot live godly in the flesh. Now, we know we're a sinner when we get saved. You know that. That's why you, know, you trust Christ as your Savior. You know you're a sinner and you can't save yourself, so you put your trust in Christ. But I'm going to tell you something. You know a lot more what kind of sinner you are after you get saved. Why? The Spirit of God moves in, the light comes in, and you say, man, I didn't realize how bad I was. I knew I was bad, but good night. <laughs> you begin, in light of the Spirit of God and the Word of God, to realize how corrupt this human nature is. But this conflict is no excuse to walk in defeat. I'm just, we got to face the reality of it. But having this conflict, we can't sit down and say, well, I just can't live the Christian life. It's just going to be like this till the Lord comes. I'm just going to... No, that's not what God intended. If we walk in the Spirit, we don't have to live according to the lust of the flesh. But you will not find victory putting yourself under the law. If you want to know what it looks like when you put yourself under the law, Paul described it in Romans 7 when he said, the good that I would, I do not. I mean, it's just a... You can't perform it. You cannot, the flesh cannot perform the law. The law is a system by which God says, if you do these good things I tell you to do, then I will bless you. But if you disobey, then I'm going to curse you. And it's a performance system. And God brought Israel under that to teach them that they were sinners. It was never designed to be a, a permanent system. God brought us under grace. We're not under the law. And the next message, Lord willing, I'm going to talk about law and grace. Folks, you know what's so sad? That many new believers, when they get saved, they were given the gospel that they're saved by grace, put your trust in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, and you're saved, and then they're brought under the law. If you're going to live the Christian life, this is how you do it, and they bring them back under the law. They need to know they're not under the law. They're under grace. Trying to live under the law is only going to intensify this conflict. And show us we're incapable of walking in victory. I'll give you, I'm going to elaborate on this next week, but look at this, Romans 6, verse 14 and 15. For sin shall not have dominion over you if you're not under the law but under grace. 
what then shall we sin? Because we're not under law, but under grace, God forbid. So then what that means is if you put yourself under the law, then sin will have dominion over you, won't it? 1 Corinthians 15, the sting of death is sin and the strength of sin is the law. When you put yourself under the law, it strengthens sin in your life. It doesn't weaken it at all. Your flesh naturally rebels against law. Galatians 5, we already read it, but when he said you cannot do the things you would, the next verse says, but if you be led of the Spirit, you're not under the law. So if, if you put yourself under the law, you're not spiritual. You are feeding the flesh under the law. The flesh will dominate you under the law. Okay? And so, number three, and this is our last point. First of all, the explanation, how we have two natures. Number two, the conflict between those natures. But what about the victory? And we're going to elaborate more on this in our next message, but I want to say something about this victory we have, and that's this. It's not our responsibility to get the victory. <laughs> See, that's, I was aware as a new believer of this conflict, I, I dealt with it and I hated it. I was in this constant struggle between the flesh and the spirit, but the problem was I was trying to defeat the flesh. And the harder I tried, the more I fell on my face. And I couldn't find the way. And I thought, okay, God saved me, but I've got to get the victory. I've got to discipline myself. I've got to conquer this flesh. You can't defeat the flesh by the flesh. It's not our responsibility to defeat the flesh. Christ already defeated it. On the cross, Paul said, our old man was crucified with him. The old man is dead. Christ is risen, and we walk with him in that resurrection life, newness of life. So, whereas it's not my responsibility to defeat the flesh, it is my responsibility to walk by faith in the victory Christ gave me. I do have a responsibility. I can't just... Folks, you can't just sit there and say, the Lord's going to do it through me. Yeah, as you get to obeying what he said by his spirit, by his power, there it, you've got to walk by faith in this. But don't trust in your flesh to get it done. Trust in what Christ already did. Let's go to Romans chapter 6. And we read the whole chapter for our scripture reading. So uh, I'm just going to read one verse in this chapter that sums up the whole chapter. And this is, this is it. I mean, it's, it's simple. But, it, but sadly, this is not taught in the religious world. In the religious world, it's legalism. They say, well, you've got to perform it, and you've got to do this, and you've got to do that. They're not being taught the truth about this. Here's the truth, Romans 6. In this chapter, Paul teaches us how to enjoy the victory that we have in Christ. And in verse 17, it's the, it's the key verse to the chapter because it sums up the teaching of the, the whole passage in just one verse. And when you go through Romans 6, you'll note three key words, and they are these. Know, reckon, and yield. Okay, you'll note that in the passage, but let's look at it. Romans 6, 17. But God be thanked that ye were, past tense, the servants of sin. God does not intend for us to live as servants of sin as believers. Okay? I understand we're not going to get rid of the old nature of this side of heaven, but we're not supposed to live under the dominion of it. It's sad to hear. You know, there's a lot of Christians have such low standards of, of what, you know, well, you know, I'm just in the flesh. No, you're not. You're in the spirit if you're saved. Learn to walk in it. And people say, well, it's just the way it's going to be. You can't do what you want to do. And no, that's not what Paul was teaching in Romans 7. He's saying that, you know what he was doing in Romans 7? He was saying this is how it shouldn't be. <laughs> this is how it is if you're under the law. But when you learn who you are in Christ, there's a victory there. He said, you were the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered you. And that form of doctrine, Paul said in 2 Timothy 1, Hold fast the form of sound words which thou hast heard of me. It was what Christ from heaven revealed through him to give unto us concerning who we are in the body of Christ. And you have it here in Romans. Um, what he's been teaching them, the doctrine of justification by faith and our identification with Christ. This is how it works. A man has three parts, spirit, soul, and body. Okay, They're related, but they're distinct. By our spirit, we know things. By our soul, that's our heart, the seat of our emotions. By our body, obviously the five senses by which we operate in this world. But in 1 Thessalonians 5.23, God wants us to be sanctified holy, spirit, soul, and body. Now look at this verse. Number one, doctrine. 
In your spirit, you got to know the doctrine. And so in Romans 6, verse 1 to 10, the emphasis is on knowing that you are crucified with Christ, buried with Christ, risen with Christ, you're dead to sin, you're alive unto God. You need to know that. That's the truth. Whether you feel it or not, it's the truth. Know, know the doctrine. Then in your heart, uh, in your soul, reckon it. You know what that is? That is a word of faith. You reckon it. In other words, you don't feel like you're dead to sin, do you? But you reckon it so. By faith, you take God at His word, and you reckon you are dead unto sin and alive unto God, because God said you are. And then you obey. That's in your body. You live it out, which is the word yield. You'll find in verses 12 to 23 you'll find this yielding emphasized. All right, your body, the members of your body, you can yield to the flesh and live sinfully, or you can yield to the Spirit and live righteously. It's your choice. To yield is to submit. Who are you submitting to, the flesh or the Spirit? Okay, so you got to know, when Christ, look, when Christ died on the cross, and shed his blood, he died for our sins. That's our justification, that he died for us, was buried and rose again. We're now made righteous in him when we believe the gospel. But we're also sanctified in him because what happens is when you get saved, you're baptized into Christ. The Spirit joins you to Christ. You're identified with him so that I died with him. I was buried with him. I'm raised with him. And so I have the victory through the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ I need to know that. I need to reckon that. I need to yield to that. And what that looks like, and we're not going to go over here for time's sake, but you ought to mark down Ephesians chapter 4, the whole second half of the chapter. You know what he talks about? All right. Look, we already saw we were taken out of the old man when we got saved and put in the new man, right? You know what he's saying in Ephesians 4? Put off the deeds of the old man. Put on the deeds of the new man. It's up to us to walk in the Spirit instead of yielding to the flesh. All right? So, Paul said, if you walk in the Spirit, you'll not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, all believers are in the Spirit. Paul said, if any man have not the Spirit, he's none of his. If any man have not the Spirit of Christ, he's none of his. Well, we belong to Christ. We have the Spirit of Christ, but not all are walking in the Spirit. In Galatians 5.25, he said, if we walk, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. You are in the Spirit if you're saved, but are you walking in the Spirit? All right, now what does, that, what does that mean? Well, it's not some kind of sensational experience accompanied by feelings and supernatural manifestations, and it's none of that. You know what it means? Compare these two passages, and we're about done. Hang with me. Ephesians 5.18, like I said, usually takes me three or four messages to get through this. I'm trying to sum it up for you. Ephesians 5.18, be not drunk with wine when it is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing, making melody in your heart to the Lord, giving thanks always for all things in God and the Father, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, submitting yourselves one another in the fear of God. Now you compare that with Colossians 3.16. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Does that not look similar? What is that telling you? It's telling you that being filled with the Spirit is letting the word of Christ dwell in you richly. The more you get God's word in you and believe it and submit to it and walk by faith in it, the more yielded to the Holy Spirit you'll be. And so walking in the Spirit is walking in the Word of God. Walking by faith in the truth of the Word of God. Now, you know what you need to do? You need to starve the old man and feed the new man. Folks, you can't be spiritual if day after day you constantly feed your flesh and starve the Spirit. Okay? What, what do I mean? Well, what is the food of the new man. How do you get nourished in the new man? The word of God, right? But you know what Paul said? 
He said in Romans 13, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. The things that appeal to your flesh, if that's always what's on your mind and what you're always giving place to, and that's a lot of different things in this world, isn't it? Making provision for the flesh makes you carnal. What do you need to do? Separate from those things. And what do you need to do? Instead, you need to feed the Spirit by getting in God's Word. And there's a lot of verses that tell us the Word of God's our spiritual food. But I'll finish this morning with 1 Timothy 4. And we'll wrap it up with this. Because just like in the physical realm, good spiritual health is based on the proper nourishment and exercise of the new man. 1 Timothy 4, 6, If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine. All right, if there's good doctrine, then there's bad doctrine. You know what the context was dealing with? Doctrines of devils. You know what that was? Putting people under the law. Your flesh can't perform the law, but the flesh likes being under the law because it wants to try. <laughs> it wants to be. It's, it's pride. It's self-righteousness, right? No, you don't need that. You're not under the law. You're under grace. Get nourished up in the words of faith and good doctrine whereunto thou hast attained. You're going to have to get in the book and learn it. But refuse profane and old wives' fables. That's false doctrine. Reject that. And exercise thyself rather unto godliness. For bodily exercise profits little, but godliness is profitable to all things, having promise of the life that now is and of that which is to come. When you live godly in Christ by his power, it's a wonderful life now and you're rewarded eternally. But I'm telling you that a physical in your physical body, if you want to be in good health, you've got to eat the right stuff, reject the wrong stuff, and then exercise. That's just very basic. Same thing spiritually. You've got to take in the right doctrine. You've got to reject the bad doctrine. And the doctrine you're taking in, taking in needs to be exercised out in your life. That's the right balance. So to sum it all up, I was born in this world of the flesh. When I got saved, I was regenerated. Now I'm a child of God and God's spirit is in me. When I got saved, my flesh didn't. My flesh is just as corrupt as it ever was. But I'm, I, I'm a new creature in Christ and I have this new nature. And they're, they're in conflict with one another. I don't have to get the victory over the flesh by trying to put myself under the law and prove I can do it. I can't live the Christian life. When I got saved, I trusted Christ because I knew that I could not earn it. I needed a Savior, and I put my trust in Christ to be my Savior. The same thing is true in the Christian life. Each day, Paul said, as you've received Christ the Lord, so walk ye in Him. Each day, I have to put my trust in His power and who He is because the Christian life is not me making my flesh like Christ. That is impossible. It is Christ living his life through me. I'm crucified with him. I'm buried with him. I'm risen with him. I'm even ascended up and seated with him in heavenly places. I need to know that. I need to reckon it. And I need to yield to that day by day, allowing Christ to live his victorious life through me. And I'm going to have to, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to feed the new man in the word of God and quit making provision for my flesh. Okay? That's just the, the simple truth of the matter. Now, it's easy preaching, not as easy living, but it's what the Word of God teaches. And so you don't have to live as servants of sin. Uh, even though we have this conflict, we already have the victory. We need to acknowledge that and thank God for it and walk in it by faith. And faith is taking God at His Word. And so, Lord willing, in the next lesson, we're going to talk about law and grace because you can't walk in the new man if you're putting yourself under the law. You've got to know what it means to be under grace. From there, we'll probably talk about the difference between our standing and our state. That's very, very important to see in the Word of God. Let's stand together, please. And we'll be dismissed in just a moment. But before we do, as the piano plays, just pause a moment here before we rush out the door. But I say to you and those that are watching online, I don't know your heart, God does. But the main thing is this, are you saved and do you know it? Um, if you died 
right now, would you be with the Lord? Uh, you, we try to make it clear in the message, I want to say it again, you can't be saved by anything you do in your flesh. What are you trusting? If you're trusting anything besides the finished work of Christ, you're not saved. What you need to do is turn to Christ by faith and trust in His death on the cross, His burial and resurrection for your salvation. The moment you do that, you'll be saved. And when you get saved, it's not the end, it's just the beginning. Now you have a new life. And you need to understand this truth of two natures if you're going to learn, be able to learn how to live the Christian life. You must know these things. Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee today for the Word of God and the opportunity once again to meet together the first day of the week. And we looked at a lot of Scripture in these two hours together. And we're thankful for that opportunity. We're thankful we have the Word of God. And Lord, this, this subject, this doctrine of two natures, there's, there's a lot, of course, to get into. And I tried to summarize it. I pray you would take what we looked at and make it real in our hearts and minds that we understand these things. And we're thankful for the victory we have in Christ. And it's to God be all the glory, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, hope to see you again.